evening, actually. Uh, I'm going to stand over here if that's okay with you. I want to welcome you uh, to Brooklyn College. Uh, my name is Richard Greenwald. I'm the Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, so on behalf of the College of Administration, faculty, and students, I want to welcome you to those of you who are not uh, Brooklyn College students or faculty or staff uh, for uh, a wonderful event. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Franklin here, who uh, is the author of uh, many books. I can stop counting after seven uh, on the list. Uh, it's, it's an honor to, uh, to, to be part of this effort uh, to support uh, the Haitian Studies Institute, which is a CUNY-wide research institute that happens to be housed here at Brooklyn College. Uh, I'm uh, very proud to have uh, Lamedi uh, as a faculty member in my school. Uh, and I want to introduce uh, Linda Day, uh, who is the chair of the Africana Studies Department, professor of Africana Studies, who will do the introductions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Chairperson of the Africana Studies Department, and we have been involved on the sidelines with helping to, the, to develop the, uh, the Haitian Studies Program, the Haitian Studies Institute, and we're very proud that uh, Professor St. Paul is with us here at the Institute. But before I go any farther, I want to introduce someone who's uh, yet unknown to me, Ms. Fabienne Cola, who's going to say a couple of things before we get to the main part of our program. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very okay. much. Um, hi, my name is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you so much to uh, Jean Edith Sapol that uh, allowed me to be here tonight. Um, invited me. I'm very, very happy. Um, uh, I'm going to say uh, thank you also to Professor Le Comte, um, who's here, a good friend and family. So, um, my name is Fabian Kola. I'm actually a um, filmmaker and producer in the Asian Indies. And I'm in Montreal. We've been doing uh, the Fabian Kola Foundation some festivals because we believe we can um, change the world through arts and culture. So, this is what we do. We do festivals from the Montreal to the Black Film Festivals and festivals in Haiti. And we're launching here um, next Saturday. Um, not tomorrow, but next Saturday, on the 22nd, here in, at Brooklyn College, um, a festival called Haiti Afro Lili. Uh, it's a very successful festival in Montreal. So we're doing it here this year for you guys. And we're going to have a delegation of Haitian artists coming all the way from Haiti to come here and perform the Haitian version of the vagina monologues, for example, I want to show you. And we're going to have um, Professor and uh, author Michelle Sukal and then Wood Lisa Del Wattman um, from Haiti and from Montreal um, for a conference. And everything will be happening at Brooklyn College because I fell in love with Brooklyn College since the last time I came here for an event. Anyway, so um, I'm not going to be very long because you didn't come here to hear me. So um, I'm going to just say before you leave, please grab this. It's over here at the table and all the information are going to be here and the website where you can reserve and secure your tickets and everything else. So thank you so very much again to this, and then congratulations for this amazing institute, the Haitian Studies um, right Department, here. right here. I'm so proud as a Haitian person that we have that here. So we should support jean in this big uh, endeavor. Uh, it's a challenge, and but we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dean Greenwood. Uh, thank you, Professor Day. Uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Brooklyn College community. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the CUNY Haitian Studies Institute inaugural lecture series with the participation of one of the leading political scientists in the field of Haitian studies, Professor Dr. Robert Faton Jr. Before formally introducing Professor Faton, I would like to express my gratitude to each of you for having been supportive in the work of the Institute. I would like to namely thank the Office of President Michel J. Anderson, Steve Schechter, Provost William Tramontano, the Office of Dean Richard Greenwood. Um, I thank also the Office of Marketing and Communication, Professor Linda Day and the African Studies Department, the Planning Committee, the Associate Dean of the Library, Dr. Mary Melry, we grant us the Woody Tanger Auditorium. The Faculty Training and Development, Professor Nicola Irons, Black and Latino Male Initiative, BLMI, um, and our department, departmental, excuse me, assistant, Jezra Mathieu of the African Studies, and Marsha Kenol of the Haitian Studies Institute. The Haitian Studies Institute focuses its activities in three major areas. Research first, research and dissemination of primary and secondary data that advance scholarships in, on Haiti and people of Haitian origin. Second, policy analysis that link scholarship on Haiti to social actions impacting the life of Haitian population to other ethnic communities. Third, and outreach and collaboration, including technical assistance that foster sustainable partnerships with individual and uh, various agencies serving Haitian community at the local, national, and international levels. The Haitian Studies Institute of CUNY will enhance the university strength uh, in the area of Haitian studies in general for students and scholars alike. For the, you know, for the inaugural lecture of the institute, specifically in, that, in this difficult time for the Haitian people, having Professor Robert Farton with us is a blessing. There are a number of academic reasons that can explain why Professor Fanton is the first guest of the Institute. First, Professor Fanton's scholarships bring new insight to a comprehensive and complex approach for explaining why Haiti, after 202 years of political independence, is still at the periphery of economy and now is also dependent on the Dominican Republic. In his book, Haiti Trapped in the Outer Periphery, he presents a solid analysis of the political catastrophe. Haiti is em embedded in during the era of neoliberalism. He reevaluates the theories of dependency and stresses both on external and internal factors. Third, in his works, he uses the theories on outer periphery to point out that we could not 
fully understand the fragility of the state in Haiti without paying special attention to neocolonialism and imperialism. We cannot have a complex understanding of the ecological disaster in Haiti, according to Professor Faton, without a critical approach of U.S. foreign policy towards Haiti. For instance, the U.S. occupation 1915 to 1934 and the post era and the era post occupation have created the perfect conditions to weaken the Haitian economy and environment. We couldn't understand at all the food crisis in Haiti without paying attention to Shada politics during the Eli Lesko regime and also the foreign policy of William Jefferson Bill Clinton who helped undermine Haitian rice production in Artsibonit just to benefit the farmer of his state, Arkansas. Professor Faton does not focus only on the external factors, the imperial logic. Also, he shows clearly that we have in Haiti the most repugnant elites. All these MRE, Marie Saucissio, it means couple their sausage with imperialism. We do not have in Haiti a ruling class able to conceive Haiti as a common belonging or common heritage. They have a lack of patriotism. In a previous book entitled Haiti Predatory Republic, Professor Faton presents Haiti as a predatory state. According to him, the Haitian state has historically represented the, paradig the paradigmatic predatory state constituting the agency of a group or class. The predatory state, as Douglas North has argued, functions primarily to extract income from the rest of the constituent in the interest of that group or class. Then, if we don't want to be humiliated by the do government of the Dominican Republic after a hurricane, if we don't want to be surprised by the next hurricane, if we want to live as a dignified people under a dignified government, it is time definitely for, uh, for the Haitian government to give up the patrimonial logic of the state the politics of the baby and the logic of predation. The Haitian state needs to abandon the politics of catastrophe and look forward to the creation of a strategic state that will be able to anticipate the present and further natural catastrophes. Please help me to give a warm welcome to Professor Robert Fatton Jr of the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia. I'll stand here, uh, although you didn't like to stand here. Uh, a taller, taller, right? <laughs> okay, first let me thank the City University of New York, and especially the Haitian Studies Institute, and uh, his uh, director, uh, Professor Tony de St. Paul for inviting me tonight to give the inaugural lecture in the series of lectures that the Institute is going to organize in the forthcoming uh, uh, semester. I want also to say that I'm very honored and very privileged to be here to be the first to give the lecture at the Haitian Institute and I wish the Institute a lot of luck it's a challenge, but I'm pretty sure that jean D is up to it and that he will set the foundation for the Institute 
which will eventually become the really major institute studying Haiti in the United States. So thank you. jean Eddy has summarized my work, so maybe I should just go home now. <laughs> but I will concentrate actually on what I call the outer periphery, which is essentially the external factors that have impinged on the development of Haiti. And uh, what we have now is a neoliberal regime that has governed the world system for the past four decades and has created a new zone of catastrophe, a zone of generalized inequities and ultra-cheap wages. This zone's politics offers a simulacrum of electoral democracy under the tutelage of a self-appointed international community. I have called this zone the outer periphery. It differs from the three other main areas of the world economy. The industrialized core, the semi-periphery which is trying to industrialize, and the developing, if you wish, periphery. The dramatic accentuation of global inequalities that has marked the past 25 years has provoked the division of the periphery into two strata, the traditional lower stratum of peripheral states and now the newer lower strata, the outer periphery. Inequalities have in fact reached obscene proportions. A report from the Credit Suisse indicates that half the world's wealth is now in the hands of just 1% of the population. The anti-poverty charity Oxfam International has put it in stark statistical numbers. The richest 80 people, 80 individuals of the planet own the same amount of wealth as more than 3.5 billion people. There's something grossly uh, wrong with the planet. And the outer periphery is a zone of extreme poverty, often besieged by wars, natural disasters, regime change, and foreign occupation. It is characterized by the evisceration of state capacity, zero-sum politics, deeply unequal life chances, and virtually non-existent sovereignty. This zone is comprised of the states that conventional wisdom defines as fragile or failed states. Failed state theorists tend to argue that failed states are the product of their own traditional culture, one that resists the dysfunctional ways the of the liberalizing process of globalization and the rational impact of that liberalization. These theorists contend that failed societies can be fixed only if they abandon their so-called backward-looking norms and embrace modernity and its triad, the rule of law, liberal democracy, and entrepreneurial capitalist behavior. These theorists maintain that this transformation is impossible without the full cultural, economic, and often military intervention of a Western-led international community. For instance, Paul Collier, a well-known economist, World Bank consultant, and author of an influential report on Haiti, has argued that countries like Haiti are failing because they are stuck in the conflict trap, the natural resource trap, the trap of being landlocked with bad neighbors, and the trap of bad governance in a small country. While these traps may impede economic growth, Collier ignores the destructive interventionism of the hegemonic powers in the outer periphery. In fact, Collier has a Panglossian view of this interventionism and argues self-righteously that the international community, and I quote, has to learn to be comfortable with infringing upon sovereignty. In a similar vein, Stephen Krasner, the former director of the policy planning of the U.S. State Department under George W. Bush and the professor of political science at Stanford University, has argued, and I quote, let me let my daughter come in. <laughs> this is an interruption. 
Thank you. So, so the professor from Stanford, as our union, you know, I quote, left to their own devices, collapse and badly governed states will not fix themselves because they have limited administrative capacity, not least with regard to maintaining internal security. To reduce international threats and improve the prospects for individuals in such politics, alternative institutional arrangements supported by external actors, such as de facto trusteeship and shared sovereignty, should be added to the list of policy options. So a new version of the white man's burden is thus in vogue that calls for the imposition of de facto trusteeship of the so-called failed state. It is infused with militaristic impulses hidden by humanitarian and cosmopolitan gestures. The element that is new is neoliberalism, which has deepened local and global inequalities and contributed to the disintegration of already weak states. Neoliberalism is the global system that maximizes market transactions, privatizes public companies, lifts tariffs and trade barriers, and removes governmental responsibility for social obligations. While this system has not undermined the major states of the capitalist core, it has in fact eviscerated nations in the periphery and especially in the outer periphery. In fact, Neoliberal institutions such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have inflicted waves of economic austerity and deregulation on the poorest and most dependent nations to the point that their states can no longer perform vital functions and are increasingly supplanted by non-governmental organizations, the NGOs. Bypassed by foreign aid, that privileges NGOs in funding decisions, such states have become empty shells incapable of providing minimal services to their citizenry. The decomposition of the state has generated political decay, increased levels of insecurity and narco-trafficking, not to mention the complete erosion of the sense of civic obligation. Under the weight of an externally imposed neoliberal regime, a quasi-permanent crisis of governance, and the devastating earthquake of January 2010, Haiti has tumbled into the outer periphery. While domestic social forces have played a fundamental role in Haiti's collapse, the nation's fall cannot be comprehended accurately without an understanding of how it was precipitated by imperial interventions. These interventions, especially in the aftermath of the fall of the Duvali regime and the earthquake, have transformed the country into a virtual trusteeship of the international community. The Interim Haiti Recovery Commission, which was responsible for coordinating the reconstruction after the earthquake symbolize this reality. The now defunct entity was created in Washington by key figures in the State Department in consultation with private consultants and lawyers in the United States itself. The commission was parachuted into the Haitian government with little warning. While it eventually underwent some changes at the behest of the Preval administration, and some other major international players, this foreign control of reconstruction, of the reconstruction efforts in Haiti, clearly demonstrated the limits of Haitian sovereignty. Integrated into the margins of the margins of the global economy, starved of direct foreign investments, and compelled to engage in ultra-cheap labor activities for exports, Haiti is at the farthest end of the global commodity chain of production. Trapped into the outer periphery, it has come under the control of international financial institutions, NGOs, and what Robert Maguire refers to as for-profit contractors, FPCs. FPCs 
worked symbiotically with powerful states to advance a neoliberal agenda in peripheral and mostly outer peripheral regions. Those FPCs seek to capture the bulk of foreign assistance extended to poor nations and tend to undermine local state capacity and privatized developmental projects. For instance, Chemonix, a paradigmatic FPC, was the top recipient of US government funding for the earthquake relief effort in Haiti for 2010-2011. And not surprisingly, FPCs and NGOs have reason to play a prominent role in Haiti, becoming the So, not surprisingly then, NGOs have come to play a significant role in Haiti. Two analysts have argued that the available evidence suggests, <coughs> suggests that NGOs and private contractors provide almost four-fifths of social services in Haiti. One study conducted before the January 2010 earthquake found that NGOs provided 70% of health care, while private schools, made mostly run by NGOs, accounted for 85% of education. In other words, the whole system has been privatized and is no longer under the control of the Haitian state, or even Haitians themselves. In fact, US military and humanitarian intervention in the aftermath of the quake demonstrated the complete helplessness of the Haitian state. The state had neither the institutional capacity nor the resources to deal with the catastrophe. Once more, the country was turned into a laboratory for humanitarian assistance on a world and worldwide charity. In fact, the most significant moments in the last 30 years of Haiti's history would not have occurred had it not been for some form of imperial meddling in its, turn, in its internal affairs. This interventionism has ranged from covert support for coups to foreign imposition of economic sanctions and embargoes to outright military occupations and heavy-handed humanitarianism. The orchestration and funding of elections have also deeply reflected imperial decisions and interests. For instance, President Aristide returned to power in 1994, and his forced departure into exile 10 years later would have been impossible without the massive intrusion of the United States, France, and Canada. The involvement of l'international, the word Haitian used to describe the major powers and organization of the foreign community, has framed domestic politics. So while Haitian rulers are the product of their own idiosyncratic milieu, their ascendancy to and downfall from positions of power are dependent on both external and internal forces. The confluence of continuous imperial interferences and domestic forces in the making of Haiti's predicament explains why treating the country as a failed state is so erroneous. The Fund for Peace which has placed Haiti seventh among the worst 10 failed states on the planet, measures failure using indicators that are primarily derived from the internal political economy. In other words, these measures trace state evisceration, economic decline, social conflicts, and political instability back to local mismanagement, corruption, and culture, and that is the way the failed state is portrayed. It is as if the unbroken pattern of imperial intervention in Haiti had nothing to do with the country's massive failure. In reality, it is only by analyzing the opportunistic convergence of interests between reactionary domestic social forces and imperial powers that we can begin to understand what is wrong with Haiti. Dependence, agricultural collapse, military coups, and state disintegration are intelligible only through the prism of this convergence of interest 
which has ultimately set Haitian in the outer periphery. The country's dire condition is the product of the hierarchical interconnection between local and global economies that continuously reproduce the massive disparities of power and influence of our current global system. As a state of the outer periphery, Haiti is at the extreme lower end of the global commodity chain of production. Wages barely assure the biological reproduction of the individual worker, let alone of his or her household. Not only is Haiti afflicted by ultra-cheap wages and abysmal social inequities, it is also dominated by unusually high rates of unemployment and a vast informal sector. In addition, its political system is but a simulacrum of representative democracy. The elections that are held more or less regularly are largely rigged. Outside powers not only finance these elections, but certify them as free and fair. It is reliance on foreign institutions and sources of funding for its own electoral process as symbolize its incapacity to exercise any effective national sovereignty. The country's dependence is so generalized that it has become increasingly subservient to its relatively better off neighbor, the Dominican Republic. In fact, from an economic perspective, Haiti has become the DR's periphery especially in the aftermath of the earthquake. It is clear that like many disaster capitalists, powerful Dominican corporations have been eager to be part of what former U.S. Ambassador Kenneth Merton called the gold rush the earthquake precipitated. In fact, it is estimated that in 2010, 2% of the 7% increase in the Dominican Republic's gross domestic product was attributable to its role in the relief operation. The Dominican Republic's extensive economic involvement in Haiti predates the earthquake. It took off in the early 1990s at the time of the economic embargo the international community imposed on the military dictatorship of Raul Cedras. Since then, the Dominican Republic's involvement in Haitian affairs has become significant. Trade between the two countries is nearly unidirectional. Dominican Republic exports to Haiti were estimated at a total of $2 billion in 2012. Haiti depends on the Dominican Republic for 30% of its imports and 10% of its gross national product. Clearly, the Dominican Republic and Haiti have relations that are looking increasingly like those characterizing core and peripheral countries. Moreover, the Dominican Republic is now bent on exploiting ultra-cheap Haitian labor in both Haiti itself or near the frontier. This new Dominican strategy seeks to limit the political cost of massive inflows of poor Haitians into its heartland. Indeed, the Dominican Republic has exploited Haitian migrant workers as a socially invisible and humiliated people for the past 70 years. For generations, Dominican Republican rulers and cultural entrepreneurs have articulated an anti-Haitian credo that rejects blackness as a sign of primitiveness and espouses the Hispanic and white identity. This racist, this racist and xenophobic ideology has left a legacy of portraying Haitians as the permanent other, the polluting other. And not surprisingly, we can see that uh, in 2013, the Constitutional Court of the Dominican Republic invalidated the citizenship of unauthorized migrants born in the country from 1929 to 2010. The ruling affected some 200,000 Dominicans, mainly Dominican of Haitian descent, who were born in the Dominican Republic and had never set foot in Haiti. These individuals became undocumented and stateless. Not surprisingly, the ruling generated international condemnation and the furious protest of Haitian politicians 
and intellectuals. Responding to such condemnation, the DR announced a naturalization law that would allegedly solve the problem of statelessness, while it rehabilitated the Dominican national nationality to those who had been born in the country between 1929 and 2007 and were officially registered with the government, it left out some 180,000 undocumented people who continue to face bureaucratic and legal hurdles to establish their citizenship. With its rejection of the ruling of the International American Court of Human Rights that nullified the naturalization law as, and I quote, out of season, biased and inappropriate, the Dominican government clearly indicated that it would not contemplate any further changes in the law and that the matter had been essentially settled. Haiti's increasing dependence on the Dominican Republic is only one aspect of its outer peripheral status. The more critical symptom is the absence of effective governance, which is not only the product of the venality of the Haitian political class, but also the direct product of neoliberal policies that have consistently undermined state capacity. For the past 30 years, the major financial institutions and organs of foreign assistance have deliberately bypassed the state and have instead funded non-governmental organizations. Such policies have weakened government institutions to the point that at the time of the tragic earthquake of 2010, the Haitian state was utterly incapable of responding to the catastrophe. And yet, in the aftermath of the earthquake, the pattern of foreign assistance has continued to bypass the government and has reinforced state incapacity. As Paul Farmer pointed out, and I quote, with over 99% of, of relief funding circumventing Haitian public institutions, the already challenging task of moving from relief to recovery, which requires government leadership above all, becomes almost impossible. Of the $2.4 billion committed or disbursed in, in humanitarian funding, only $25 million was provided to the government of Haiti. Moreover, Haitian NGOs were virtually excluded from relief or recovery funds. Only two received funding, and that amounted to only an embarrassing $800,000. In fact, a significant portion of both relief and recovery assistance funded organizations located in the donor countries themselves. For instance, more than 75% of USAID funds went to private contractors inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway. The Haitian state failure to become an effective vehicle for the resolution of the most pressing problems confronting the country is thus not just a reflection of an enduring domestic political crisis. It is also the direct result of the type of foreign intrusions and interferences that have marked the country's history. In this perspective, if Haiti is a failed state, it is so because the world economy has failed. This failure is vividly demonstrated by the economic slogan, Haiti is open for business, adopted by the Mount Haiti government in the aftermath of the earthquake. The cruel irony is that the slogan was nothing but a repackaging of the ineffective policies of the 1970s and 1980s, which generated little capitalist investments and actually led to a massive political and economic crisis. In reality, the country's political instability and lack of infrastructure, characteristics of its outer peripheral nature, have discouraged foreign investors. For instance, although direct foreign investment increased to a record high in 2011, they amounted to only $121 million. It is really peanuts. In comparison, the Dominican Republic received $2.4 billion the same year. The continued absence of productive 
capital investments in an outer periphery such as Haiti is no accident. It reflects the preferred movement of capital on a world scale. As James Ferguson has pointed out, capital is glob hopping, not glob covering in poor countries. And unsurprisingly, capital has largely hopped over and bypassed Haiti. Thus, the logic of global capital has contributed to further debilitate Haiti's already fragile governmental capacity and tenuous sovereignty. In fact, Haiti is a geographical space occupied and managed by peacekeepers, FPCs, and NGOs of a self-appointed international community. NGOs, as we know, very much like the FPCs, are in fact the main engines now that are supposed to solve the problems of corrupt and failed states. But they have, paradoxically and unwittingly, become part of the neoliberal assemblage of occupation in post-disaster and post-regime nations like Haiti. Trapped in this assemblage of occupation, Haiti's domestic economic policies are largely framed in the headquarters of the major international financial institutions and bilateral donor agencies. Similarly, Haiti's electoral process is heavily funded by foreign powers and under, the, uh, under their surveillance. Moreover, troops from the United Nations, the so-called Mission des Nations Unies pour la Stabilisation on Haiti, MINUSTA, are the military shield protecting this political order. Haiti's problems are thus not only the product of its own domestic social forces and processes, they are also the result of its subordinate incorporation into the world economy. Not surprisingly, the country's internal political class structure, its material environment, its cultural metrics are dialectically linked to the imperial reach of l'international. In other words, <coughs> while the major players of l'international seek to, meet, to maximize their control and minimize the cost of their domination over the country, Haitian rulers can maneuver to keep a limited degree of autonomy and extract badly needed scarce resources from l'international. There is thus a small space for negotiating the extent of domination and dependence. This space varies depending on statecraft, chance, and geopolitical realities. What is clear, however, is that Haiti must conform to what Alasdair Roberts has referred to as the logic of discipline, a logic that has compelled virtually all nations to devise policies and institutions that protect and insulate the interests of global capital from democratic accountability. This logic is rooted in a deep skepticism about the merits of conventional methods of democratic governance, because these methods undermine the freedom of capital and slow the spread of globalized markets. Neoliberal globalization has transferred significant power to a transnational technocratic class whose mission is to depoliticize certain economic issues and ultimately insulate itself from democratic accountability. In addition, neoliberalism has weakened outer peripheral states and limited their capacity to make autonomous policies. Outer peripheral states, however, are not helpless. They can manipulate their domestic political environment and strategic choices to achieve certain objectives. The recent history of Haiti's relations with Cuba and Venezuela demonstrates well the manipulative and creative capacity of some Haitian rulers in crafting their diplomacy. It is well known that the United States strongly opposed the further development of Haitian relations with Havana and Caracas. From 2006 to 2008, the United States sought to block and then undermine the Petro-Caribe Agreement that President Preval signed with Venezuela, even though the U.S. Embassy acknowledged that it would save Haiti 
some $100 million a year. U.S. Ambassador Janet Sanderson warned Preval and his senior advisors that to deal, and I quote, that to deal with Chavez would cause problems with us. This is directly from the WikiLeaks cable. The Preval administration, however, defied the United States and implemented the petro Caribe plan. Moreover, to the dismay of Ambassador Sanderson, Preval decided to attend a special, as a special observer the summit of the Bolivarian Alternative for the Americas in Venezuela for the express purpose of finalizing a trilateral assistance agreement between Haiti, Venezuela, and Cuba. Not surprisingly, Preval's determination to defend, to defend, Haiti, to defend Haiti's national interests contributed to the deterioration of his relations with the United States. Ambassador Sanderson noted sharply that Haitian officials, and I quote, did not understand that the United States was not willing to tolerate a greater regional role for Venezuela and Cuba. In spite of continued misgivings among U.S. officials, Haiti under President Martelly followed Preval's friendly foreign policy towards Havana and Caracas. This policy was more than a matter of establishing some independence from Washington. It was a response to the simple reality that unlike other foreign donors, Venezuela was willing to provide foreign assistance to the Haitian state itself, instead of privileging NGO-led development. Whatever the ideological differences may be, Haitians have started to realize that the result of some 40 years of NGO and FPC-led development have been at best meager. They are starting to understand that it is time to change trajectory, and they tend to agree with the analysis of Ricardo Satanfus, the former special representative of the Organization of American States in Haiti, who denounced donors and NGOs for corruption and lack of transparency. As Satan puts put it, and I quote, we have hundreds of millions of dollars in the hands of the NGOs without any sort of social control, without any transparency or government management. And we are accusing the government of Haiti of being corrupt when the government of Haiti doesn't even have money in their hands to be corrupt with. We cannot demand from Haiti what we do not demand from ourselves. All projects that come to Haiti, that weaken even more the weak Haitian state, should be discarded. We cannot make Haiti the Disneyland of the NGOs. And it is this growing understanding that has provoked Haiti into organizing new election with its own limited resources after it rejected the 2015 ballots that were endorsed by the international community in spite of gross irregularities. Whether the coming elections will be fairer, freer, and more transparent remains to be seen, but they represent an important step in the country's quest to regain some modicum of national sovereignty. It is clear, however, that Haiti's institutions remain extremely fragile. At this point, it would be very difficult for the country to engage in a completely independent form of uh, development. At this moment, in particular, when you look at what has happened in the South, we have to be realistic and pragmatic and understand that we are going to continue, at least for the uh, short term, to be dependent on NGOs and FPCs. But the reality is that the country has very limited freedom to act on its own policy. Politicians are compelled to rely on foreign sources of power. And that, in turn, has generated an acute form of dependence. Haitian politicians, if you look at the post-Duvalier period, are completely at the mercy of the international community. Different political leaders with very different political persuasions, such as Jean-Bertrand Aristide, Raoul Cédras, Gérard La Tortue, René Préval, and Michel Martelly rose to and remained in 
and fell from positions of power depending on their respective relations with France, Canada, and the United States. There is little doubt, for instance, that Michel Martelly became president because of the massive interference of the international community in organizing, funding, and counting the votes of the 2010-2011 elections. Martelly himself said publicly in an interview on French television that he knew that he was coup proof because Minusta was in the country and that Minusta and the international community would not tolerate any type of political instability. So one of the problems that we have is that acute dependence. The presence, for instance, of the Minusta forces. And we can see that that presence has had significantly negative consequences. Minusta is perceived by Haitians as a force of occupation, and a force that has caused a deadly cholera epidemic, has been guilty of sexual abuses, and has failed to create the security that it promised. So Minusta is contributing to the growing popular discontent with the status quo. It has come to the country, and it has not fulfilled the promises that it had made. So the question now is what can be done? While I have little to offer in terms of remedies for Haiti's failures, it is clear that the post-earthquake strategies of reconstruction should be abandoned because they differ very little from past development efforts and will lead to the same impasse. Although these strategies pay lip service to building state capacity, agricultural renewal, an economic decentralization, in reality, they are old wine in new bottles. They continue to advocate a type of development that is utterly dependent on ultra-cheap labor and the assembly industry. In fact, Paul Collier stressed in his report to the Secretary General of the United Nations in 2009 that export processing was the heart of Haiti's economic revival. In fact, he saw it as the only viable strategy. So you needed to export garments. That was the main idea. Now, while that kind of export strategy should not be neglected, it cannot be the priority in a balanced strategy of poverty alleviation and self-sustaining economic growth. In fact, Collier's neoliberal export processing recommendations which have guided Haiti's post-earthquake economic strategy will create more dependence, more food insecurity, and more inequalities. In addition, it is likely that they will intensify rural migrations to urban areas and fail to generate the employment and wages required to further the expansion of slums. The problem is that the key foreign powers and financial institutions funding Haiti's current project of development continue to advocate the very same destructive neoliberal policies that led to the current crisis. The neoliberal policies have rejected the complete transformation of the agrarian sector. They argue basically that Haiti cannot engage in agrarian development that would feed its own population and that it should concentrate only on what they perceive to be the comparative advantages of Haitians, of the Haitian economy, which is basically cheap labor. Now, I would argue that it is hard to believe that the neoliberal industrialization advocated for Haiti is the right strategy. I think it is a much better strategy and that the strategy that is much more adequate for Haiti's political problem is to, in fact, engage in the privileging of the agrarian sector. While privileging the existing structures of rural production or a return to some idyllic 19th century la coup agriculture would lead to an impasse, there is no convincing reason to assume that the modernization of the countryside need to be naively utopian. In fact, launching a current agrarian reform, transitioning to higher tariffs, and implementing a public plan of reforestation, 
would do more to employ, feed, and equalize life chances of Haitians than any neoliberal industrialization based on cheap labor and uncertain demands for apparels. In fact, the utopian belief is that after investing the bulk of scarce resources in the apparel industry for more than four decades, it can now miraculously generate the virtuous cycle of development that it has consistently failed to deliver. This is not to say that export-oriented production should not be part of the development plan, but it should not be its central driving force. The agricultural sector, particularly food production for the domestic market, should have priority. As the social scientist Fukuda Power explains, in Haiti, with approximately 55% of the population in rural areas, and two-thirds of them relying on agriculture as the main source of income, this sector is still the predominant economic base for the population. Agricultural development can play a central role in poverty reduction because it is the source of direct and indirect livelihood of the majority of the poor. If you look at the experience of South Korea, of India, and of China, the reduction in poverty was to a large extent based on the building of an agrarian foundation where peasants had access to land on a much more egalitarian basis. So the agrarian reform is absolutely critical for the alleviation of poverty in Haiti. So the, prior, the prior, prioritizing agriculture is not some form of idealistic uh, view of things. It is in fact the means of responding to the poverty of the country and of alleviating that poverty. It means that it is necessary to build the modern infrastructure of roads, irrigation canals, and electrical plants. Labor-intensive methods should be privileged in order to reduce the high levels of unemployment and the exodus from rural areas. To implement this plan, the Haitian government must first engineer a transition period that would impose certain protectionist measures. The country simply cannot afford to continue to have an open-door policy that destroys its domestic economy. This plan is neither radical nor backward-looking, but it does conflict with the dogma of the international financial institutions and the interests of powerful domestic and foreign forces. Unless Haitians decide to take matters into their own hands and challenge these forces, any plan of this kind is unlikely to see the light of day. While taking matters into their own hands is no easy task for Haitians, it is a challenge that they must meet, lest the country fall into further economic and political decay. Let me end, however, with a disclaimer, because it is easy to proclaim from afar in the comfort of well-paid American academia in the heart of the capitalist world economy. While it is possible to feel Haitian in the diaspora, it is quite another thing to face the vicissitudes, uncertainties, and insecurities of daily life in Haiti itself. I have no right to claim any moral high ground in my condemnation of those responsible for Haiti's predicament. In fact, consciously or unconsciously, an intellectual such as me partakes in some of the privileges generated by this warped global system that is monopolized by a mere faction of humanity. As a member of the Asian elite and of the diaspora that has opted to adopt the American nationality, I must acknowledge that I am a privileged individual living in a cocoon of fundamental contradictions. I have thus the luxury of distance I can afford to look at Haiti's present and future with a deeply critical eye and a certain sense of despair. The vast majority of Haitians simply cannot. To go on facing the daily struggle for food and shelter, they must ultimately believe 
that things will change, but that they cannot simply fall apart continuously. People must believe that the struggle continues, not just for themselves, but also for future generations. It is this belief that inspires hope and the promise of a better tomorrow. And it is a belief that is especially needed in the aftermath of the devastation recently caused by Hurricane Matthew. Thank you. join me with yet another round of applause for our guest speaker. <laughs> to lay out an understanding of the international context for what we see in the country of Haiti. Actually, I didn't have a chance to give a proper introduction to our speaker, who is the Julia A. Cooper Professor of Government and Foreign Affairs in the De Department of Politics at the University of Virginia. So he has come to us from the University of Virginia. And of course, he is the author of numerous books from 1986 to 2014, covering the politics and economics of Africa, the Caribbean, and Haiti, of course. His most recent book, which we are, are privileged to hear uh, from, Haiti Trapped in the Outer Periphery. 2014. He is also the recipient of the 2011 Award for Excellence of the Haitian Studies Association for his commitment and contribution to the emerging field of Haitian studies for close to a quarter of a century. So this is the man that you have been listening to. Um, so we have a very good crowd here of Haitian studies experts as well, uh, people from our community, students of Brooklyn College, and I'd like to open the floor up for questions, which uh, we have some time here. Please direct your questions to to our guest speaker. Yes, we have... Professor uh, Franz Antoine Lecomte. Lecomte, Franz Lecomte. Uh, uh, Marsha. some level of sovereignty given the interventionism that we have suffered over the past 30 years, more than 30 years, but particularly uh, yeah, over the past 30 years. I'm not quite sure. There, there, there are some limited spaces, as I've said. For instance, the relationship with Cuba, the relationship with Venezuela, were attempts on the part of Haitian governments to generate a space where they could have a different political economy. The type of money that was given through, through Petro-Caribe was distinctively different than the type of money given by the IMF, the World Bank, the United States, the French, because it went to the state. Now, this is not to idealize the Haitian state. The Haitian state is very inefficient, it's very corrupt. On the other hand, if you look, for instance, at the experiences of countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, which have become industrialized, highly technological countries, if you read the literature, 
of the 90, late 1950s about South Korea, for instance. South Korea was considered a basket, basket case because it was corrupt. Corruption existed, but the government of South Korea managed, because of the Cold War, and because of the Cold War, the United States gave money in a very different way, and the economics of the period were fundamentally different than the economics of the last 30 years or so. You know, in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, the economy was basically based on the notion of Keynes. You redistribute some money, so you have you generate a strong state that is involved in some of the planning, you have some protectionism, etc. Now, we don't have that now. The only thing that we hear from the international community is that the economies have to be open. And if you have an open economy in Haiti, you are basically saying that you're going to have no national production because you cannot compete. You need to impose tariffs. You need to have some protectionism. There is no single nation that has been able to industrialize without, in the initial stages of development, protectionism. Bill Clinton comes to Haiti, he says, well, you know, you don't need tariffs on, on, on rice. It's going to be good for you. You're going to get cheap rice. At the same time, where does the rice come from? It came from Arkansas, initially. And it was highly subsidized by the federal government in the United States. The same thing with agricultural production in the European community. It's highly subsidized by the government. But when it comes to third world countries, no, 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 no. You have to open up. You have to privatize everything that you have, which generates intense levels of corruption. Because when you privatize, what do you do in a politics like Haiti? You sell stuff to your cronies. That's what happens. It's not just in Haiti. It's everywhere that you have that process. So how do you extricate yourself from that dependence is a huge problem. I mean, it, the proximity to the United States is beneficial in some respect, but highly contradictory. You know, the United States looks at Haiti, to put it bluntly, the backyard. And basically what the United States wants is no boat people, to put it crudely, and stability, whatever stability there is in the political system. So we cannot try to change the situation in Haiti by continuing that dependence. But when you try to break that dependence, it's politically dangerous. And it's not only dangerous with the international powers, but it's dangerous also in the local political system because there are lots of people who benefit from the crisis. It is, you know, when there is a crisis, it's also an opportunity for some people. You know, what you have now, and you can already see that with the tragedy of the hurricane, you're going to have massive inflation. Cost of construction, the food. And who's going to benefit? The people who import. And the people who import are the people who have huge economic power in Haiti. And there's very low, very little local production. So it's an extremely difficult process. I, as I've said in the conclusion, I, I kind of despair. But, you know, and, and I've said also, I'm comfortably here. So it is easy for me to despair. For Haitians in Haiti, it's a completely different situation. And the fact that we are all here is because we know that there is a damn problem in the country. It's not that we don't like Haiti. It's like things are so complicated and difficult that you exit. I mean, Breval said that. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> he said that very publicly. And, and to some extent, it's true, but it's a tragedy that the president of a country can say, well, get out of here if you want to have a better existence. So I need to answer your question, but, but that, because there are real problems. I mean, you look at the countries that attempted to do that in Latin America, they're all falling apart. This is what we see. Brazil, the experiment of Lula is done. 
is realizing a massive crisis. And Cuba has good relations now with the United States. Today, rum and cigars are going to be imported by the United States. And Cuba is going to change fundamentally, whether we like it or not. So let alone a country like Haiti. So we have real problems. But you see, in a weird way, it's not just Haiti. It's the whole world. I mean, when I'm talking about the outer periphery, there are outer peripheries in the United States, there are outer peripheries in Europe. This is growing. And this is why you have the rise of bizarre ultra-right movements. Because the dominant groups, they literally screw you. I mean, when you look at the statistics on inequalities, it is absolutely shocking. You know, I gave you two things. 86 individuals have as much wealth as two, 3.5 billion people. How in the heck can we manage in a world like that? It's, it's, it's a messed up globe, completely messed up. Trust you, some of us are part of it. But, but the people who have power, they don't seem to be worried about it. May I say, though, that the question was a, a collective action here, which may not, but I do think it's a different issue than what people can do in Haiti as opposed to what people can do here, who at least have freedom to speak, freedom to write, freedom to have a strategy. So anyway, that's something the people here have come, I think, to try to think about that because people have come because they are concerned and because they do feel that there might be something to do. In the meantime, I'm, I'm going to ask people, when you ask your question, to also please identify yourself, tell us who you are, and uh, then we'll, we'll keep taking questions. Okay, can you please, please identify yourself? You mentioned a couple of times South Korea as a place that has some developed and fact we know South Korea they are you know also in South Korea they have they have a dictatorship for many years. In Haiti we have dictatorship for many years. So why South Korea they have some development and in Haiti we still you know at the bottom of the Well there are different kinds of dictatorships. There are dictatorships like the one that of, like Duvalier yeah. who, who has basically one that extracted resources and wasted those resources and acquired you know, the fortune illicitly. Now you have other dictators who may do this, they are repressive, but they invest in the infrastructure. But the, the situation in, in South Korea is much more complicated than that, because you have North Korea. When you have North Korea and South Korea, you wanted to have a model that could fight the North Korean model. And if you look at one of the things that happen in South Korea, and that's as a result of the North Korean experiment, is that there was a massive agrarian reform. If you have an agrarian reform that is going to redistribute land and give titles to poor peasants, they are going to buy into the system, even if the system is corrupt. And the government invested in agriculture initially, fertilizers, irrigation, etc. And there were monopolies by the state. And what the state did in South Korea, you see, for instance, when they were, let's say that they were, they were producing sugar or they were producing rice, the government said the corporation, the parastatal, bought the price, I mean, bought the rice at a price that was lower than the market price, but enough to continue to survive. The, the surplus was then reinvested in industry and in research. Then you have also in South Korea what is called the Shebol. Those are family, you know, in industries basically. And they were not completely fused with the government. There was a tension. The government told that you can invest there, and if you invest there, then you'll get, you, you know, you cut. In Haiti, we don't have that stuff. You know, the, the big families in Haiti are not interested in local production. The vast majority of them, they import, or they are in the government industry. And that is not going to generate the kind of development that the poor country like Haiti needs. Look at the experience of Caracol. It's a disaster. 
And it was a predictable disaster. And it created, was supposed to have created by now 60,000 jobs, which is not that many in any case. It created 6,000 jobs. The houses that have been built are starting to fall apart. And the tragedy is that people are going to come around uh, Caracol because they think there are going to be jobs. This is the same thing that we have in Cité Soleil. This is the same thing. I was at a conference. I made that argument in front of the South Korean guy who was actually a say company. And he said, you are going to see. That's four years ago. He said, it's going to be very different. It's nothing different. And actually, if you want to go there now to look at what's happening, it's not easy. Even if you're a journalist. Because it has received bad press. And then it's an environmental disaster too. It was one of the areas in Haiti where, let me say, the coral. The coral? No, the corals. The corals, yeah. That was an area that was supposed to be protected. It was one of the few areas. So what did they do? They ignored it. And then you have in 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 in, in Caracol, you have a, a lot of uh, painting stuff that is being produced. Where is it going to go? In that very location, it's a disaster. We have we have natural resources. We know we have gold, but the government doesn't know how much because this is controlled by other people. We have petroleum. We don't know how much. Because we have no capacity to see what's under our soil. So we, the reality is that we are so weak in terms of infrastructure that it's a real problem. And we are in a different historical moment where the only game in town is globalization. But globalization generates also contradictions. People are not just in poor countries, fed up, but there is no real alternative. This is the tragedy of this beginning of the century. That we know the system is crooked, but we don't really have a programmatic alternative, a viable alternative. Well, let's hope so. I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah. I think, Professor, there's a one, one um, thing to do to your country. Uh, if you stop importing your stuff to, for your country, then the country going to make their own things inside the country, so without buying any other countries. If you do that, then your country going to be developed and people are going to come up. Because I came from this small island too. So it's in my country also, we had some part, we stopped all the uh, imported items. So after that, our economy came back up. That all the other countries. Oh, I agree with the idea that you have to curb, uh, uh, you know, the, the open door policy. But it's a very complicated process because the World Bank and the IMF are not in the business of doing that. And in addition, there is no local production at this time. So if you were to do that, let's assume that you would have a government say, well, we are going to. Tomorrow we are going to impose a tariff on rice, which is going to be 50%. You couldn't feed the population because the production has gone down. And the problem, the other problem is that you need a transitional moment because if you do that, poor people won't be able to buy the food because the imported rice is actually cheaper. So what do you do? So, in so and, and this is why it's like a drug. You are addicted to it, you know. Initially, people say, oh yeah, it's much cheaper. But then the whole agricultural sector is destroyed. And what happens when you have that? People from La Tibonite, they exit. La Tibonite is falling apart. And they go into the, into the city. And where do they go? Into a slum. And there are no jobs. So you need a, you need a very long-term project, a transitional moment where you curb, you see, the, the, the open door, but you cannot immediately eliminate it. And that is if you have a government which would be committed to that. And even if you have a government that is committed to that, there's no guarantee that the government will survive because of the international community. So you have a series of very 
harsh realities. Okay, I'm going to um, try to take the questions from people whose hands are up, starting from over here. And again, could you please identify yourself when you uh, ask your question? Okay, what I'd like to do is take a few questions at one time, um, so that we'll have, say, one, two, and there was a hand over here. So, uh, one, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight questions. Okay, let's do three. So that's one, two, three. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, 
require agronomists, chemists, all, all sorts of uh, skills and, uh, and specialties. So I think you, so it's not just people working the land, but you have many aspects, facets of agricultural professions. Now to my question, uh, what role do you see for the Haitian diaspora? Um, because from what I understand, the South Korean diaspora was somewhat instrumental in their development. And so my question is, what role do you see for the Haitian diaspora? Okay, that's one question. Thank you. Role of the Haitian diaspora, yes. From what I see, I'm a student from Brooklyn College. Uh, my issue right now is the fact that when I look at the situation, the way you present it, uh, we have a lot of situation to deal with. First, first of all, on the ground right now, because of the the way the uh, the, the villager uh, have to deal with economy situation to send their kids to school, to uh, they have to cut any tree, any whatever tree, whether it's, it's food tree or it's normal tree, the court then do make charcoal to, to send their kids to school. Now you were dealing with a different situation where the place where you used to make a good agricultural food, the those land is gone. They have to use this, this, this soil anymore. So there is no soil for the agriculture. Now, if we want to bring agriculture, if we want to make agriculture the, the engine of the economy, how we can go about that, because we, if we lose, we lose this soil, it's going to be very, very difficult to get there. Okay, thank you. I think I'll take several questions, not just three. Yes, is that Mr. Santos? Yes, I, my question was similar to his much as I asked from. Another student, my student. Yes. I know in South Korea, one of the things that I've read is that they did programs to bring the South Koreans back. They actually built the community once in South Korea, it looks just like Germany. They got the professionals from South Korea to come back and they gave them place. Do they, you think that Haiti would benefit from doing a program similar to that, bringing back their professionals to their country to help build their country together versus depending so much on the international community? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. If I may, uh, how radical how radical uh, an exercise, uh, developmental exercise in the out years in your periphery, the internal as well as the external periphery, we're going beyond the career. How radical in the next 20 to 25 years, the Haitian human, social, economic development has to be to reach parity Stay with Panama, not even, not even Venezuela or, or Cuba. How radical do you seek to develop where they have to go? Because if what you're saying is this issue of Haitian functionality is so metastasized, so everybody is equal and completely feckless, you get that. Where do you see this going? Bring the thesis for the true, the true essence of academia here is to really cure this illness. Where do you go from here? Okay, did you have a, look that behind you? Yes, another student. Uh -huh. Oh, the 
I'm sorry. Uh, my question, my name is Fritz Gerville. My question is, uh, how do we reconcile this dilemma, given the fact that the state doesn't have much control of the land? At this time, at this point in time, I don't think uh, we have mass land for mass production. What I've seen in Haiti, I've seen uh, local domestic production, the mom and pop production, as, uh, as far as is uh, related to uh, agricultural product, and uh, it's not even enough to satisfy the local, the domestic uh, consumption. So how do you co how do you reconcile that? And at the same, point, you have uh, uh, some sort of a mistrust between any type of idea of agricultural development on the part of the the the, the citizen of Haiti. They 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 they're afraid of mass production. Uh, they always think that like there's some something behind it. Uh, the last time I was there. There was uh, an attempt to produce uh, banana. Uh, I think it's doll. So I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure of the name. But uh, they they went to my hometown with a project of forty-seven million dollars, and you had a mass. You have a, the, the massive of the people that took the street. To the, uh, uh, they protest against that. So. <laughs> okay, and then. Yes, ma'am. My name is Valerie. I'm a student here at Brooklyn College. My question has to do with dual citizenship. I am Haitian, and I have not considered a becoming an American because I know the impact that it will have when it comes to me going to my country and trying to make a difference and make a change. When I mean a change, by going there and actually getting involved with the local community. I know that it's really hard. Once you become an American citizen, you can no longer make that difference in Haiti because our constitution kind of put a stop on how, um, how, let me say it better. We live here, let's say dual citizenship could have made a big impact on the economy. That's what I think. I think if we allow that, if the government, Haitian government, reconsider whatever was written in the Constitution to allow us, the young people here, to go back and put, make a change. How do you say that, how, how, how do we go by that? How do we force our government to reconsider having dual citizenship? All right, I think that's okay, fine. a good Let me start with that. Actually, you see, very bizarre thing happened. The constitution was changed when when Rival left the government the day before. So we have two constitutions, and we don't know which one is which. Uh, and Martini voted, I mean, enforced a new constitutional thing. So, actually, you. You may have the right to have the dual citizenship. You can have two passports. You can. You're supposed to be able to vote too. Yes, you are. But there is no organization for that. But you're supposed to. So 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 it's a complicated business. And every single Haitian government since 1986 has been talking about dual citizenship. That, that's, and eventually it will come. Whether it's going to be enforced is a different matter. You know, we have that, 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 that slogan in Haiti, the Constitution c'est papier, mais vous êtes c'est fait. You know, Constitution is paper, but the people who have power, you know. So it remains to be seen. Now, the diaspora is contributing enormously to, the, to Haiti. Haiti would disappear if it weren't for the diaspora. Two billion dollars every year is sent by the diaspora to Haiti. That's way more than anything we get from the international community. 
So there is that contribution. Now it's a different matter. You see, when the diaspora goes back to Haiti, because Haitians in Haiti feel, well, why the heck are you coming back? You're going to take our jobs. I mean, this is a simple zero-sum game. And there's also cultural differences now. You know, when you go to Haiti, you're diaspora, whatever that means, you know, your Creole is not that good, your French is not that good, you know. That's the reality, that's the way Haitians. But when you send the remittances, whoa, come on. And we know that. This is a simple reality. So there is a problem. That doesn't mean that the diaspora could not go back to Haiti and try it. But it's a complicated thing because of the political situation, because it's a zero sum game at the moment. So, but you can have the, you know, you can have two passports. So that's. So, Monica, did you take notes on your questions? Yeah. The other one, I, I, the role of the diaspora and what, you know. To some extent, I've answered, but there could be organizations in the United States that could, in fact, mobilize uh, the Haitians in the United States in a different way and also mobilize the type of American policy vis a vis yeah. Haiti. Yes. You see, I remember when Aristide was overthrown in 91. The Haitian community was critical in organizing and fighting for the return of Aristide. There was a certain degree of unity. Now, the Navalas exploded and things went in any and every direction. So that kind of unity that we had has vanished. And this is a problem. But there are practical issues. I mean, for instance, deportations. You know, as you know, two weeks ago, the Obama administration said the situation in was so nice that there is no need again to, to pay attention to that real deportation to come. Which is really a, a crazy idea. The situation in Haiti two weeks ago was bad. Now it's catastrophic, especially in the South. And they've rescinded that. So, but people would organize. There are ways that you can mobilize in the United States to change American foreign policy. I mean, if Asians were on the board who were really organizing, we, we should never have accepted that Bill Clinton would compel the Haitian government to lower the tariff. I mean, the tariff were at about 45%. They went down to 3%. What do you expect? Your market is going to be destroyed. And even Clinton said, I don't know if anyone saw that, that was one of the most amazing things. You know, Bill Clinton was in front of the Senate and he said, oh my goodness, I just want to run in the country of Haiti. He said that publicly, but almost crying. He didn't do a damn thing afterwards to change that. So there, there, there's a certain accountability that patients in the diaspora could... So, so, so could we demand that the uh, uh, American government for, for that because he wasn't Bill Clinton acting alone, he was Bill Clinton the President of the United States. Well, there's a lot of things that we should ask for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the occupation was, a, you know, we remember the occupation, they came and took all these arms in gold and they moved them to this right. private bank. And that is what we are not going to get a penny from that. Well, my point is another thing, but I'm just talking about even more limited things. Well, that sounds very specific. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they took it and didn't want it to get the bank in, 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 in the U.S. That's a fact. That's beautiful. But you're not going to get the money. You're not going to get the money. Yeah, no, but they're not, they're not going to get it. You know, it's like the United Nations with cholera. Every scientific analysis done by the U.N. itself says, we brought it. And they are talking about, well, we are going to give you some money to do. And they are talking, 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 and we don't see anything. It's not even a, a, a real apology, let alone, I mean, can you imagine if something of this sort were to happen in Europe? You would be talking about billions of dollars of reparation. It's a question of power, and we don't have the power. That's, that's how politics works. We had a couple of other questions that I didn't get to the last time. Yeah, the, the other thing was about the land. Okay. Yeah, the land is in bad, in very bad uh, situation in Haiti. 
deforestation, but it's not as bad as people had claimed. You know, when you read most of the stuff on Haiti, you say that Haiti has only 2% of arable land. Yeah, that's, that's false. Oh. That is completely false. And it stemmed from certain pictures that were taken at a particular time when you had, and they were in National Geographic, you had the frontier, and if you, if you travel that way, it's still the same. Green on the side of the, you can look at the desert. But there has been much more sophisticated analysis through satellites. And from what that has produced, we probably have 30% of the land which is still, in some fashion, uh, not completely disintegrating. So that should be safe. And then you should, this is why I'm, I'm emphasizing agrarian, uh, the agrarian transformation of Haiti. Because you can reclaim your soil. But that requires investment, concentrating your resources there, and giving priority to that. If you don't do that, this is a political decision, first. The second decision, I can, if you have a government that decides that you have the power to do that. Because if you have an agrarian reform, you're going against very powerful local interests. Yeah. So, you know, so it's a problem. But I don't see a future, that was the other question, how do we manage to alleviate poverty if you don't go that way? Now, I don't quite know how you go that way, and if, if, given the power relations. The only thing that gives me some hope is that, you know, history is full of moments where people surprise us, and they do things that are absolutely inconceivable, unthinkable at a particular time. I mean, Haiti has done it before, when you look at 18, but we shouldn't continuously go back on 1884 as if, okay, fine, we did it. That doesn't solve the problems now. But it, what 1804 shows is that a completely revolutionary situation occurred in spite of power relations, in spite of the international community, and it was done to the surprise of the Western powers at the moment where the whole global system was the system of white supremacy. So if that could be done then, there is no reason to believe that something like that could not happen. Now how do you do that? I'm not quite sure. Use the days of poverty. Sorry? Use the days of poverty, poverty by itself, and that hardship that is already ingrained in the population, they can hold on to that hardship. Two, three generations, they didn't Yeah, but you see, it's a complicated business too. It, and, and what does Cuba do now? But, but, but I would like to leave it, we, we really do have to get out of here, and I'm, I would like to leave it at the last thing that Professor Faton said, which is that if in 1804 there could be a revolution against one of the greatest powers in the world at that time, and lined up with other world powers at that time, if it could be done in 1804. It could be done now. I like that. Okay. So let's leave it at that. And also understanding that this dialogue will continue. We have the Haitian Studies Institute here. We can't get all the answers tonight. But we're going to work on it. We're going to work on it, and we're going to work on maintaining a place where this kind of dialogue can happen, and where solutions can be worked out, talked out, and perhaps new consensus can be developed that will help move this process along. It's incremental. So we're trying to do our part here at Brooklyn College. Okay. Ok, nous avons un grand pile anglais dans la tête, nous avons un grand pile haïtien, donc moi je remercie nous tous qui viennent la première conférence, donc nous connaissons. Professeur Faton, moi ne pas aimer utiliser le mot prestige, mais c'est un professeur qui est capable de dire, un politologue qui est plus sérieux que nous gagnons, qui gagne une capacité d'analyse assez complexe. Donc, moi, je remercie l'empile parce que lui toujours supporté l'institution. Donc, professeur Faton vient là, il vient juste pour être capable d'aider l'institution parce que nous l'avons à des zéro nous. Ça c'est première activité, c'est un big challenge lié. We have the Haitian Studies at Brooklyn College, part of the City University of New York. So we do need 
to transform the Asian studies like our um, international academic research uh, unit. Donc, professeur Faton Bano, il y a un gros backup. Donc, nous, nous avons demandé pour nous battre un gros bravo encore pour professeur Faton. Um, donc, je remercie tout le monde qui vient là. Donc, surtout, qui est sans Haïti. Donc, l'institut a nous grand pile bagaille pour nous faire, par exemple, pour nous-mêmes, grand pile date qui est important. 18 novembre, là, nous, moi-même, moi, je moi, travaille en pile la question de la mémoire. Uh, I have a book, a uh, draft book, um, on civil society and politics of memory. Question de la mémoire, là, nous avons le 18 novembre, 17 novembre, faire un événement culturel pour instituer un capable de parler de mémoire, on ne sait c'est des questions. Donc, ma besoin de support, backup, tout le monde qui est dans la communauté, tout le monde qui est dans le domaine média, tout le monde qui est dans le domaine éducation. Donc, ça c'est un commencement. Donc, je demande nous pour nous quitter les données, nous, pour l'aide, plus d'événements pour moi-même qui gagné une base de données pour nous toujours inviter nous. So, moi, je voulais dire nous merci en pile et nous allons continuer à réfléchir sur Haïti. And lastly, if you have further questions, please reach out to the HSI at brooklyn.cuny.edu. Please stay in touch with the HSI through that email address, hsi at brooklyn.cuny.edu. And thank you all for coming. Another another announcement? Okay, we have another announcement. Uh, uh, on the 20th, October 20th, we're going to have a protest against the deportations of Haitians.